Okay. Um, now, what I, wanna, what I wanna do is try to get people, in some sense, go through two or three different things, but in one, in that, so it's not too scattered. Um, to get people to look at this question that I think was differently posed and is posed. Well, let me start it at the top. You know, it is posed by this thing that everybody gets now as this sort of the big question, what's the fourth phase space? Uh, just for those, you know, we have the abiotic, we have the, the non-living things that don't move on their own accord, that aren't uh, uh, self-contained entities. Uh, and we have living bodies, which are made up of parts of the non-living world, but at some, in some mode they're alive. And they interact with the non-living. So they create something we call the biosphere. Now, one, one of the difficulties people have with this, which you have to keep in the back of your mind, is that life as a principle is not defined by any particular living thing. It's not inside a living thing. It's not a substance. It's a principle that becomes operative under certain circumstances. And we know those circumstances exist because we have life. And we know that life is different than the non-living. Now, there's some interesting questions still to be discovered as to what this principle is. But it's not part of, it's not something that is simply a particle in every living thing. Now, this is actually a principle itself. For example, if you take any universal the concept human being is not a concept that's, that's a substance in, in each human being. It's a principle that's manifested in human beings. But it's outside of any individual human being. You might say outside and above. So the principle of life manifests itself in the changes that living beings make in the abiotic and create the biosphere. And then Vernadsky, and I'll come back to Vernadsky a little later, in terms, just in terms of some interesting quotes to show you how he's looking at things. And some of this will get at this question of the, of the non-Euclidean versus the anti-Euclidean, just as a, in, not in depth. But then you have, uh, Vernadsky says, the, the noosphere. And the noosphere is the products of human creativity. So the noosphere, and here we, you, know, you can begin to look at, uh, though in, I, I wouldn't do this in a one-to-one -one way, uh, the kinds of things we were looking at last night in the, um, the Curved Surfaces paper, or this question, why do we study Gauss? Well, on the one hand, you know, I wouldn't leave out one factor in life, okay, uh, particularly for older people. There's a usefulness in playing around. You don't always have to have a practical reason to do something. Sometimes you do it because you're testing your mind's capability. And that doesn't mean you just do anything, but there, if, you, if, you, if you're dealing with something that you know represents some historical development of human ideas, there's a virtue in just looking at it, digging in a little bit. And then you might find the historic course. But in the case of Gauss and this whole question of surfaces and some of what it will... I'll look at from a particular angle that Lynn has raised, this question of a shock front. And some of you have seen some of this. I mean, I'm going to be add some of it, some things to it, but hopefully those of you who have seen it and absorbed all of it will um, bear with, so to speak, because we have other people, we have people who haven't seen it, um, and so on. Um, but so you have the noosphere. Now, what, what you have to recognize, the noosphere doesn't just, doesn't just act on the abiotic. The noosphere acts on non-living things and living things. For example, you know, it, trees, plants, domestic animals, and so on and so forth. It also acts on the inorganic, the abiotic. So we look at infrastructure. Infrastructure creates a relationship between human activity 
and the biosphere and the abiotic. So we reshape. And, of course, this is what kind of, uh, I'm not going to go into, freaks people out. For example, the atmosphere. You know, people get freaked out because they say, well, the atmosphere is being messed around with by human beings. In a certain sense, that's true. That should be part of what we take into account. But that doesn't lead you to environmentalism. Where you have this idea of defending the natural order from human intervention. Because that's really what, what environmentalism means. It's not keeping the environment. It's protecting the environment from human beings. Which makes the assumption that human beings are not part of the environment. You know, it, 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 the basic idea is God made a huge mistake or Mother Nature just bungled it all up because there you were going along, everything was just peachy keen and along came human beings. That is sort of the environmentalist view. You know, birds crap all over everything. That's not a problem. You know, human beings are a problem. Okay. Now, the truth of the matter is the atmosphere was a product of life. You can say the atmosphere we know today was not the atmosphere of some X number of hundreds of million years ago. Actually, in some ways, not that late by planetary standards. In other words, you have the development of trees and grasses and so forth are about 170 million to 200 million years ago. They come relatively late in the, uh, in the developing order. And this has a lot to do with the nature of the atmosphere. Just like the oceans are not a natural product in the sense that somehow the oceans started out a certain way and they never changed. Rivers, lakes, they're all affected by the activity of life and ultimately human activity. That's in effect the natural order of things. You just have to know how the natural order of things works. Now, now the question is, how do human beings operate? We affect the planetary surface. But the question is how? Now, when we discuss this, quite, let me give you an interesting quote from Vernadsky, and then I'll reference something that came up yesterday. This is in a paper... that he wrote some words about the noosphere now this is 1943 uh, here a new riddle has arisen before us thought is not a form of energy how then can it change material processes the question has not as yet been solved, as far as I know it was first posed by an American scientist born in Lvov, Alfred Lutka. But he was unable to solve it. As Goethe, not only a great poet but a great scientist, once rightly remarked, in science we can only know something has occurred, but we cannot know why it occurred. So how is it that thought changes the universe, changes nature? I mean, Lynn has raised this on a number of occasions. A, a thought, an idea, has no, a hypothesis has no weight, no mass, no force. How does it change the universe? How does it act? Now, it's very interesting because somebody might give you a neurological reduction, but that doesn't tell you, that tells you the consequences of the thought acting. It doesn't tell you how the thought acted. Now, what we do know about the, uh, human, the human mental activity is that it, it, it occurs as in, 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 in an, a single individual. On the one hand, every creative act, every new idea, every reproduction of an idea occurs in a single individual. That's the sovereignty of the human mind. That's why we talk about sovereign human individuals. Because they actually are, in a sense, the rulers of their own thought process. 
It's not the same thing as freedom from a Lockean standpoint, or what most people think, in, even in this room of freedom. I do what I want to do. That doesn't make you sovereign. From that standpoint, a pigeon crapping on a statue is free to do what it wanted to do. There was no constraint. It had to go and it went. Now, if that's your view of freedom, I would say it's a rather uninteresting view. The sovereign individual has a capability of generating and acting on a new idea. But now, how does, how does that action on a new idea occur? You know, no individual, given what we've said about mortality and our own physical limitations, can enact that sovereign idea as a social process. That idea has to be communicated, replicated in, in some degree, known by other human beings through a social process of communication. Now, that, roughly speaking, is the fourth phase space. The phase space of human creativity and its communication, socialization, through the means in which these ideas are communicated, which is largely what we refer to as classical forms of art, which are not a period, as you're often taught. It's not a period in, in artistic development. It's a type of development, which has a standard of communicating certain ideas which are true about the universe, but which also reflect the way in which the human mind develops. Now, for example, just to give you an idea of what I think, we had uh, this uh, presentation on music that went to a lot of these things, and then people would say, well, okay, what, what goes on here? Well, think of the following thing. What is it you're communicating in music? You're communicating the way the mind works. Now, there are two elements to it. For the, I'm not reducing it, but these, there are two things to think about. One is, there's the actual creative process in the human mind. Secondly, there's the communication of it. Now, how does thought occur in the human mind? And how do you communicate it? Well, on the one hand... Start with the second level. You communicate it through language. That's why you have to develop a certain kind of richness in language. A capability of expressing hypotheses, expressing things that are not seen. So you're not just pointing to things. Every hypothesis has the form of something unseen. If I were to do this and that, I would be able to measure the following consequences. If I acted in such and such a way, other people would respond. So all language has to have sufficient development to communicate that, that type of universal idea. And this, there's a whole history of this debate over universals. Aristotle hated universals. He said it doesn't exist. Occam hated universals. They don't exist. Locke and Hume hated universals. They, well, you can generalize, but there's no principle. The entire tradition that gave us modern science bases itself on the human mind's ability to generate something that's not in the physical circumstances, that's not simply a statistical generalization, an idea. Now, the idea has to be is, now, how does thought occur? Now, that, that gets to be an interesting problem. We may not be able to simply answer that, but clearly thought occurs at a level that's pre-linguistic. It may contain the elements of language, but it is in a certain sense a dialogue in your mind. It's a sequence of, of Ideas, actions associated with them, problems, doubts, fears, paradoxes, all that occur in the human mind. Now, the idea of music 
is to express, in a sense, the, the language of the creative mind. So that, uh, uh, that every piece of music is that one idea, but now how do you express that socially? You, in a sense, take the things that are pre-linguistic in the way human beings communicate. They're both universal, but they're also the way in which ideas, paradoxes, anomalies, resolutions, principles, voices, are then put together to express the idea as it's generated in the human mind. Which is why, for example, you have to use that we, that's something I think has never quite been resolved, you know, the idea of bel canto singing. Because you're taking the human voice as it's properly organized, as a natural instrument, the range, the transitions, the colorations, as the use of voice is properly used, that's in a sense the background of language. That's what's really in language. Language is not a series of words on a page and a dictionary definition and a set of grammatical rules. It's a perfect example of Euclidianism. Like Euclid, language, grammatical rules, dictionary definitions all come after the language is created. Dante did not work off of a dictionary set of definitions of Italian, a set of grammatical rules, and then so I'm going to write this book that's going to express these grammatical rules. He created the language out of a certain kind, uh, out of poetry. The same thing happened with, with Euclid, it's straightforward. With Euclid, you had Greek geometry, which was basically a constructive physical geometry, which made a series of discoveries, which then Euclid, about 150 years after, the, well, 100 years or so after the main ideas were developed, proceeded to codify in an act axiomatic system. You can think of it as trying to give the grammar of geometry. I mean, how did Greek geometry actually develop? This is very, Greek geometry was centered around three problems, which for 100 years, 150 years, occupied the minds of Greek geometers. And in the course of failed resolutions, solutions, recognizing it couldn't be solved, developed the concept of physical space-time. The first one, right? What were the problems? Trisecting the angle, doubling the cube, and squaring the circle. Now, clearly, some of these problems were soluble, some weren't. Doubling the cube, which we've looked at, generated a concept of the way in which, uh, you know, physical space-time goes through certain fundamental transformations defined by this concept of powers, which means literally we have a greater power to act, a greater power to measure, a greater power to do things as we comprehend that, there, that cubic space is different than a surface. And we get certain relations in surfaces because surfaces are embedded in cubic space. Other problems were not soluble. Trisecting the angle also required moving to a different kind of space-time. Squaring the circle was not really soluble. But in finally resolving what was wrong with the effort to, sol to, to solve it, typified by Kuz as late as the 15th century, but I think some of the Greeks knew that the, what the problem was. That's really how Greek geometry developed. That's how geometry developed. Not through discovering a set of axioms and how to deduce what the world looked like. Now, in one sense, it's let, that's, that's the fourth phase space. That is, the dominating character is human creativity that shapes the way in which we interact with the entirety of the physical universe in all of its forms, and most especially with other human beings. See, so think of an interesting thing about a quartet. People think of a quartet as four voices, or maybe more. And I, you know, I often, when I first heard quartets, I used to think in terms of a conversation, which is sort of a, 
uh, and particularly when you get to, to Beethoven, it's funny because you do have all the raucousness and the intensity and the dissonance of a normal human conversation. Okay? But there's a problem in viewing it that way. Because you, unless you're crazy, you don't have four voices in your head. Okay? Now, but the quartet is heard in your mind, in one human mind. It's created by one human mind. Really, the quartet is the pre-linguistic, or what we sometimes would call the pre-conscious, but in a sense, sensed development of an idea in the human mind. Now, at least if you approach it that way, you begin to realize that these things do occur as one idea. Maybe only vaguely comprehended, vaguely conscious, that the classical artist brings to the fore. And it is the way the human mind works. That's what music is about. In one sense, music is a perfect example of the fourth phase space. But keep in mind two things. The fourth phase space, as understood this way, exists outside of any individual human being. Though without individual human beings, you wouldn't have it. And it's not as though there's a fifth and a sixth and a seventh and an eighth and a ninth in one of these infinite regresses. Okay? There is just the fourth phase space. Now, if you, if you look at the way these things develop, how, how does the human mind actually function? How do we develop? How do we change? And where are we? What I want to do is also reflect, and a lot of my attention this morning is going to be on where are we? Now, remember, in a certain sense, if you go back to the October 12th webcast, which was not that long ago, it was three, four days ago, that Lynn did, it's Endgame 2005. That we're, we're, we're at a critical front in human history where in a certain definable way we've gotten to the point where unless we do certain things, unless we change, in a sense you can say unless we act from the fourth phase space to change what we're doing, human civilization is in deep trouble. And at this time, I'm not going to spend as much time as I sometimes do on certain kinds of things. But in other words, unless we literally act to create things in the noosphere, in the basic infrastructure, in the basic standard of living of the population, unless we dominate the financial system with physical requirements of the noosphere, we're going to lose. And we're at the point where it can't go on any further. I mean, I think one of the greatest examples of this, though it, it, get, it is, is because, precisely because you're talking about an advanced sector country, the United States, is this question of the, the hurricane in Louisiana and Mississippi and Texas. Because there was no reason for us to be destroyed like, by that. There was no reason for a whole city to be lost. Everything about the threat of this natural disaster was known. You have an, an image in the United States itself of what happens when you don't maintain the physical economy. You cannot maintain a population. Look, we have cities in the United States like this where the population is unsustainable at any, at any modern standard of living. For, you take, for example, what we did to New Orleans. You look at a place like Detroit. These are wounds in the country. You know, you, you look at as a people of you know my hometown, Baltimore, is, is, is virtually a living example of the way in which you can create a shock effect in a population, where the accumulated deficit of infrastructure, medicine, education, sewage, etc. And the, that, what it means in terms of the future for the population creates a circumstance where a population becomes a center of disease 
drops in living standards and so forth. Now, I'm, this, this is what this is the African situation at large. But Baltimore, Detroit, in a, 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 to a certain degree, is Africa in the United States. The same thing is true for New Orleans. Only there it came out a little more shockingly. All at once. Now this is, this is what happens when you have this defect. When financial considerations, and there's a great deal of other stuff to work through, but when financial considerations, when people think money, we could say uber alles. And I think it's appropriate. Above all else, money. You know, the, the, the way this famous uh, line from that movie a few years ago became such a catchphrase. Because it did capture something. You know, movies are stupid, but once in a while it expresses something about popular culture. Show me the money. It, it did capture something. You know. Show me the money. You know, you have this guy... You know, playing a, a you know a football player, and the only thing he's got in his mind is show me the money. Because remember, it was the football player, not not the uh, sports agent that had the line. The agent was a crud, but the guy said, "This is this is my ambition. Show me the money. I'll go wherever the money is." Because that's everything. That's power. That's the way the world works. Well, that kind of consideration. Just the, the, the simple idea of the money, the growth in the paper value of financial instruments, which are tradable at light speed, as they say. Since no physical economic process occurs at light speed, how can you run a physical economy based on transactions that demand instantaneous, near or near increasingly instantaneous return. Now, for example, how many people here have really thought about this question of compound interest? It's a, it's a good example. People know what compound interest really does? How many people don't know what compound interest is? Well, it's a simple, it's one of these things, it's like a lot of things you've seen. Let's say you borrow $100. And you're going to pay 6%, I'll take it, per year on the $100 compounded. Well, that means the way it works is at the end of the first year, you owe $106, 6% of 100 But the second year, let's assume maybe you've, just for the moment, you've only made a small payment. The second year is 6% of 106 plus 106 Okay, so if you put the debt off or you roll it over like credit cards, it's 6% of 106 plus 106. In other words, the debt that you owed, interest applied to the new debt. Okay, so then the next year, if you do the math, it's 6% of something like $115. And then the next year, it's 6% of 115 plus 115 minus whatever you paid. So it compounds itself. It's, a, it's, an ex, it's, a, it's an exponential function, even though it's a low rate of growth in this case. Now, what happens in the economy, to give you a little idea of this, and if, if you begin to trade the debt before it comes due, you've got a compound demand of financial growth in the, in the economy. So, for example, if I've got $106 worth of, if I've got $100 worth of debt that's going to pay me $106, and I want to offload the risk, or I want to have somebody else hold the $106, I've got, and I've got to give them an opportunity to come up with a profit on that. So, maybe I let them gain 8%. This can be done through discounting or something like that. And I get the cash immediately. I get $99. Okay, but now this guy is going to compound it, not at 6%, and he might want to have that return right away. So he sells it, or somebody else may speculate on the value of the debt. 
Now, they may go into debt to speculate on the value of the debt. Because that's the biggest way to get a fast return. Borrow $100, buy this bond, generate something over the bond overnight, pay the loan back, and you have an infinite rate of return. But now what's happened? You've, excel, you've increased the debt in the economy, and all of the debt demands a compounded exponential growth. Now, all of this can, ex- can be traded over and over again and accelerate through the financial system while you have one actual economic transaction. Let's assume that was at least a transaction. Okay? One transaction. Now, where is the income coming that supports all of this financial paper and debt in the economy? From this one physical action. So how do you get the payment ultimately, although it doesn't take this simple form, throughout the entire financial system? You begin to lower the payments on the, to the physical act. You cut wages. You don't, you don't ma- maintain the machinery or the equipment. So this, this issue of compound interest or compounded rates of financial growth means that you've got a, an exponential and accelerating tendency in the financial system. Now, when I want to look at what, what LaRouche has pointed at the end game 2005 is we've now reached the point where this financial system is no longer sustainable in its present form. It, does not, it cannot exist. And in particular, what you're going to see is a hyper, what he calls a hyperinflationary shock front. In other words, we've reached the point where the effects of this financial speculation can no longer be kept out of the day-to-day elements of the economy. We've reached the end point. We've reached, and you'll see what, uh, the idea that I'll go through hope, rather quickly, of a shock front. And you'll, uh, hopefully we'll be able to make the point of how this really relates to precisely the kinds of things we were beginning to look at last night. But keep in mind, and let me make another point. Before, what I said about the music is true with the Gauss. The real connection here is not that we're going to take a one-to-one map, sometimes it might work, from a Gaussian surface or a Riemannian surface, though I'll show you some interesting things. And we're going to show you how the economy looks like a helicoid. And as the helicoid reaches a branch point, the economy reaches a branch point. These are ideas. These are reflections of the way the mind is able to organize and discover principles in the universe. The universe has a changing characteristic. And because the mind is able to generate and extend to its boundaries, the principles that we're operating by, we can begin to see where these boundary conditions might occur and generate new ideas or ways of uh, intervening or shaping the way the surface looks like or at least knowing what it's going to go through. And on that basis, we can act on it. But these things become properly understood metaphors or ways of representing the actual epistemological process, the way ideas are generated, and the way ideas are connected to our ability to act in the universe. Now, so the the, the Gauss thing is like the music. It's, in a sense, an image of the way in which the mind grasps principles of the universe, conditions in the universe that lead to moments of change, and pose certain problems. And, you know, there's no mechanism that tells you how to solve the problem. There's principles, but there's no mechanism. It's a living thing in one sense. It's a creative thing. You have to see how it's moving and developing. And know the principles of creativity, but not a mechanism. Not a formula. Now, let me give you, we'll get to the, the, the first one, which is, of course, this thing everybody has seen. Is this visible? Yeah. Okay, this is this image of the shock front that Lynn says we 
entered. And look, this we'll talk about later. This is what's driving everything else. Cheney, even Bush's insanity. Because Bush just can't deal with this stuff. He looks at it and he goes and drives his pickup truck in Crawford or his bike or whatever. I don't know. Maybe he'll be doing, um, uh, the next thing he'll do is uh, skateboard. You know, something to keep him busy. Okay. I mean, his tendency when faced with something like this is to retreat from the anxiety of it. Which makes him manipulable. As mean-spirited as he might be, the real thing is, you got somebody like Dick Cheney saying, George, it's going to get rough. I, you know, we got a way to deal with it, George. We, we're going to go to war. Why don't you go to Crawford for a while? But first, before you go, declare war on somebody. <laughs> and George, desperate to get away from the anxiety, says, okay, that's the way it works. I, obviously a little simplified, but, you know, and this is what these, what, what's happening is don't, see, if you control finances from whatever standpoint, what's finances? What makes it a controlling element? Finances is credit. Now, some people think it's a bad word. Finances is debt. It's how you organize debt. What's important about debt? It's not that all debt is bad even though your parents probably told you that, or these days they probably didn't tell you that. Probably your parents told you debt is good. The more debt you have, the more creditworthy you are. And, you know, our, your, our gift to you when graduating high school is, you know, $10,000 in debt, you know. Credit card debt, you know, we'll get you a car, we'll put it, you know, that's debt. And you're going to be so indebted, you're going to be just a part of the mainstream. Okay, but there was a time when people thought debt was bad. Or you get these neocons who think debt is bad if they have to pay it. Well, that's the principle, right? They think debt is a bad thing if I have to pay it. Now, on the other hand, if you can cut my taxes and push the debt on on somebody else, that's not bad. That's kind of smart. If you really look at the way these people think. Now, but what is credit and finances? Credit and finances is the future. What's credit? We're, we're going to we're issue or credit is a form of debt. We're issuing a certain amount of credit because we're we're saying that we can we can organize our activity to do something based on this credit, which allows us to expand our economy and pay the debt. So if you control credit and debt. You control a society. In some ways, it's that simple. That's why banking is important. It's, banking isn't important because we want to get rid of all bankers like some populist fruitcake and find honest money. In a certain sense, we don't want honest money. We want honest bankers. So what you, what you want, to, you, you, the whole idea of national banking is to reflect through some centralized element of the banking system that's under the control of the sovereign nation state. A means of regulating and directing the future of the country as an expression of the responsibility of the nation to meet uh, the general welfare of the population. So, I mean, you know, you have to watch a lot of these things. Now, what, what happened, the, the issue here is, well, what is this? Because it has, it has a very special form. I'm not, you know, if you look at the front end of this thing, it's a hedge front driven shock front. In other words, one way to look at this is don't look at this as air. This is an image. It's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a concept expressed in these visual terms. But don't think of this as air. Think of this as a financial system where what we would think of as the atmosphere is essentially extremely speculative financial instruments, financial derivatives, futures contracts, mortgages, mortgage-backed securities, all kinds of financial instruments that are the controlling element of the way in which credit and debt is organized in society. Now, 
the problem that we face, the, the reason we've come to this point, look, what we're, what's happening? In a sense, the financial system, because this is really what's up here, the financial system is accelerating the demand for the growth and the value of financial instruments at such a rate that we've reached a point beyond which this system can simply continually turn itself over in, in the form of financial paper alone. In other words, as long as they could manage the system and simply keep rolling over the mortgages, rolling over the futures contracts, rolling over the derivatives, you would have, you would have hyperinflation in financial paper. Mortgages kept going up in value. Stocks would go up in value. Futures contracts would go up in value. And as long as the rate at which that was done in the, in the financial system was great enough to, let's say, keep this atmosphere coherent, everything was all right. Because in the economy, while you might get a certain amount of seepage, and what you really got was because people believed these financial instruments were, were growing, they were willing to, in effect, offload their physical economic requirements and say, okay, I'm going to make money and when I get, you know, I'll, have, I'll sell my house when I retire and I'll, ha and I'll have a lot of money. That'll be my nest egg. They had the illusion that these financial instruments were going to be there and that somehow there was going to be an economy to support it. Some of this came from looting the third world or looting, this is the whole issue of outsourcing. If we can find the means to cheapen the cost of things by underpaying labor globally and we can keep these financial instruments growing only in terms of financial instruments, then people in the, uh, in the United States can live with the illusion that they're going to be able to succeed 10, 20, 30 years down the road. Or we can have massive credit card debt because we can invest in financial instruments which are based on this kind of process. Now, however, there, there is a reality that intervenes here. First of all, the rate at which this financial paper has to be turned over accelerates beyond belief. So, for example, what did you have with all these, internet, these infotech firms at the end of the 1999, 2000, and so forth? They bubbled up, but, of course, there was no market for it. It was a, half of it was a fraud. They couldn't do anything, and people weren't going to pay that much money for pop-up advertising all day long. So people invested tons of money in the stock market. These things raced up, but then there was nothing there. There was no income. So they collapsed. But the, the financial system didn't completely depend on that. The financial system then was offloaded into more derivatives, into mortgages. Prior to that, we, we, this whole process had taken off in the late 1980s, where financial derivatives, which didn't really exist before 87, they existed in a small realm. You had futures contracts. But you have to realize through the 1980s, everything was turned into this. The price of oil was based on the futures market. That only began in about 1981-82. And there are many, many other examples of this. Now, two things have happened. One a little bit further back, and then one in the last few months. Okay? First of all, because of the fact that these financial instruments were demanding high rates of return... By 2000, 2001, by the collapse of the uh, information, uh, the, the stock market bubble, what you had was a lot of these financial instruments were no longer growing at a very fast rate. But a great deal of money was required to be pumped into the system to keep them up at all. So the liquidity that was pumped into the system was being pumped in at a greater rate than the growth of the value of financial instruments. For example, the stock market today is still about 10% below where it was in 2000. The NASDAQ, despite all the regrowth, is about 60% below where it was. Pension funds were wiped out that never recovered. 401ks were wiped out that never recovered. 
There's been no recovery. What they did was they took a new sector of, of uh, the financial si- system, pumped liquidity into it, and used that to prop up the entire system through some of these lunatic derivative contracts and so forth. A multiplication of financial instruments based on a small number of transactions. Now, in a sense, you can think of 2000s back here, but what that did was it created a circumstance where already, already the degree of a financial acceleration was out of control. You had mortgage-backed securities. But remember, mortgages are based ultimately on the income of the population. So you have to keep cutting the income and expanding the value of the property. So you create areas of bubbles. Areas of bubbles, not bubbles throughout the whole country, because you couldn't sustain that. Southern California, New York, Boston, Washington. And you have a system that is characterized by the tendency to create bubbles everywhere. Because there's so much financial demand that wherever you send these financial demands, they're going to create a vast acceleration in prices. We've had hyperinflation, but in the financial assets. Now, the second element of this is in the spring of this year, you had the first introduction of a, a crisis General Motors and Ford. Now, these are two huge companies. You're talking about $700 billion in corporate bonds. That's, and if you realize leverage, you know, people now talk about, you know, $700 billion, so what? You know, the old joke, you know, a billion, Everett Dirksen, who was a congressman back in the 60s, kind of a curmudgeon Republican, <laughs> once said, look, a billion here, a billion there, pretty soon you're talking about money. You know, uh, but... The fact of the matter is, when you're talking about major corporations, all of the, all of the uh, consequences of that in terms of employment and so forth, and $700 billion in corporate bonds, upon which trillions of dollars of derivatives were based, credit derivatives, futures, stocks, corporate bonds. Now, in the spring, it was clear General Motors and Ford were in deep trouble. They were downgraded. Their bonds were downgraded. Now, this caused <clears throat> what even some of the financial press admitted was a mini blow-up in the spring. Tens of, probably hundreds of billions of nominal financial value was lost. Now, the uh, Lynn at that point said, look, we're going to lose the entire auto sector. This whole thing is going to blow out. And people said, yes, 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 but not for another few years. And they did nothing. Six months later, we've lost Delphi, and we're going to lose everything else. And it's not going to take two, three, four years. Now, at this point, you can say we reached the sonic shock. In other words... The rate at which the financial system was demanding return and what it had to get the return off of was faster or it reached the rate at which any kinds of turnover or transactions could occur within the financial, the hedge funds, the derivatives, etc. We, we were now at the point where the only thing that could be done was to speculate in the area of primary commodities which could not be kept out of the actual cost of daily existence. And so, as you reach this shock front, because at this point you need something that you know people are going to have to, you think people are going to have to do. They're going to pay $3 a a, a gallon, $4 a gallon. They're going to pay for home heating. And so the idea was you could now run up a massive speculation in copper, oil, nickel, zinc, to a certain extent, and precious metals as a side element. Not because they're useful, but because under a hyperinflationary regime, people will go into precious metals, gold, silver, palladium, and so on and so forth, a platinum. 
So, in, we've now reached in the spring this area of where the, the, the hedge funds, the financial management, has now lost control and the kind of spiral is reaching down into the economy. That's, a fig, that's a, an image of what's happened. In a certain sense, the geometry has changed. We've reached a boundary condition, a singularity, where the flow of financial instruments, which had previously been kept out of, even though it was expanding, the elements of daily life had now flown over that boundary, but now in a totally different form. So that the financial aspects are being directly rolled over based on the direct looting of the physical economy in the United States in the form of hyperinflation. And we're seeing that. And remember, most of the statistics you see are complete crap. Now, what I want to do is give people, okay, we, th this is a Riemannian conception. The problem is, how do we look at this? Because what we really want to look at is, at this point, a change occurs. A, problem, a, a, a conceptual change, an actual change has to occur. In one sense, we have to change simultaneously the medium and the concept of the economy. Now, to get a sense of this, I think it's useful to look at this problem of uh, sonic and subsonic and supersonic flight and realize that a lot of people thought that supersonic flight was not possible. Now, of course, the real truth is a lot of people thought heavier than air flight was not possible. Okay? Like Lord Rayleigh and others of that type. Because they basically had a statistical gas model of air. And their idea was that there, you, if, if, as you tried to get lift in a, in a heavier-than-air body, the amount of collision amongst the particles of the molecules of the air as a gas would be so great that the, the wing would never get enough lift. It would be, in a sense, pounded down. That was, they, now, to give you a further idea, for example, a guy named von Karman who was one of the leading people in U.S. aerodynamics, did not believe that the jet engine was possible. Now, Car von Karman changed. He was a Hungarian, and he realized when he went to Germany in the mid-1930s that, in fact, they were working with jet engines, and they were working. So he had to change the way he looked at things. But these guys didn't believe it was possible. They didn't believe that supersonic flight was possible. Okay? because they had, a, they had a statistical approach to the atmosphere based on a, a gas model, and they believed in this idea of entropy. And you'll see how this works. Now, let me, let me just look at some of these. Um, um, some of these figures. Uh, well, first of all, let, let me, uh, give me the one that's the graphic of just this shock uh, the, the graphic of the, of the uh, just a wave. I think it's a number. This one. Okay. Now, with that, whoops. Okay. Now, look, the idea here is that there's a very simple idea of it uh, in, in the simple sense of a shot. This, take this as a wave. Okay? Now you can see the direction of the motion of this wave. These are all normals. To the, these are all perpendiculars to the wave itself. Now, if you compress or move this wave faster so that you compress it so that the crest catches up with the trough, at a certain point, can see these things will pile up, and the, 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 in effect, the wave crashes. You have a simple idea of a shock front. The simplest idea of a shock front is a wave crashing on the beach. 
Because what happens? You know, everybody says, well, come on, that's just normal. But think about it. Let's suppose you have a wave in the ocean. Why doesn't the wave just come right up the ocean, up the, up the uh, bank? What makes the wave crash? Well, what happens is there's a certain drag at the bottom of the wave as it begins to climb up the bank. If it, if it could somehow just go up the bank, the wave wouldn't crash. But what happens is you get a differential rate where the wave, as the bottom of the wave slows down, going up the bank, the waves in the back, the crest of the wave in the back are moving faster. And as this occurs, as this differential accelerate increases, the crest hits the trough and crashes. Otherwise, waves would be coming up on the shore. So it's a simple model of something that goes on all the time. Now, in the, in the 1860s, Riemann wrote something called uh, the propagation of finite Way, uh, of waves of finite amplitude. And he, he, he references the fact that if you take a wave and push it through a, uh, a cylinder, that you reach a point of, of compression such that a shock wave is, uh, occurs, like in, a sound, in, a, in, a, uh, in the way sound moves. But what Riemann said is that's not the end of the story. At that point, there's a change in configuration. There's a change in the kind of action that occurs. And it's on the basis of this paper that people worked on the idea of uh, uh, supersonic flight. Now, let me, uh, um, let's go to, uh, let's go to the series from 22. Well, actually, no, let, 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 let's not go to that yet. What I want to do is, look, I don't have a graphic for this, so some of these things just don't. But what happens, what really happens in supersonic flight? I'll give you a, a good way to start with this is propeller props. Because during the period at the end of World War II, interesting things happened. Remember, we're still operating in a domain where people didn't know if supersonic flight was possible. That was a real question, okay, in 1945, not that long ago. So wh why was this a problem? What was happening was these guys were flying these props, and small single-engine fighter planes were reaching speeds of about 500, million, uh, 500 miles an hour, uh, some of them in a dive, some of them, I think, in level flight. Now, now to keep this up, to get a, an image of this, Supersonic uh, sound waves vary in speed depending on density. So, for example, sound at uh, sea level travels about 650, 660 miles an hour. So if you're doing 500 miles an hour, you're about three-quarters of, you're about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 Mach, 0.8 of the, the speed of sound at sea level or close to sea level. Now, there's some very interesting things that, that occur at this point. These guys were having big problems flying these planes even at that speed or going into a dive. One of the ways they tried to go through the sound barrier was to take a propeller-driven plane and go into a dive from 15 or 20,000 feet. Okay, I'll give you something totally wild just for those of you who like odd facts. Um, they once in the 1960s took a DC-8, which is about a 120-passenger commercial airliner, and took it up to about 40,000 feet and put it into a dive, and it did break the sound barrier. Okay, I, I, I'm sure it was not an easy plane to fly at those uh, those rates. But anyway, the uh, so what what happens to these propeller-driven planes is a couple of interesting things, and some of this even existed with jets. But this is really what happens when you hit a boundary layer, and there's uh, there's more to to, to so what's going on? The way in which, a, in the simplest sense, there's two things involved. And I think one is sort of a simple-minded uh, hypothesis that has a certain truth. The other is more interesting. Okay? When you fly an, a, a, a propeller-driven plane, you get lift 
what appears to be the case is initially you're getting lift from the differential in the flow over the wing. In other words, you curve the top of the wing. Actually, in one sense, the more the curvature up to a point that you might think, the better it is. It, you, know, you curve the top of the wing, and you have the bottom of the wing a little flatter. Now, why? Because the air flowing over the top of the wing flows faster because the, 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 the air has a tendency to keep itself stable. So it flows faster, and as it flows faster, the pressure on the top of the wing is less. The pressure per square centimeter is less. And so it's like what you feel when you put your hand out. If you curve your hand a little bit, you get a little bit of lift. So you get lift. Now, there's a second place that you get lift from, which is the propeller. The propeller on an airplane functions like a, a wing. If you look at a propeller, they're all curved, and they're all curved from the top like a helicopter. Okay? So you get a certain amount of forward lift, and then you get lift off of the wings. Now... The simplest thing, now, there's a second element to it, which is really, in some ways, more important. And this is what you get from the Riemann school. Because there really was a kind of fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants approach. And, 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 you know, in some ways, if you look at what the Wright brothers did, it was interesting. Okay? But then you have a sort of a, a school that came out of Riemann, which, which was uh, Italians and Germans, a guy named Prontel and Busemann, and a guy named Betty in Italy. And their view was it wasn't that simple. And you're going to see how this, there's two problems that come up. Their view is that as the air flows over the wing, you have a boundary condition where the airfoil of the wing meets the air. There's a differential. There's a different kind of flow. An, an infinitesimal layer of discontinuity where you get a accelerated flow where there's a kind of smoothness because of the way in which these two things meet, such that the air, in a sense, squirts in that layer. And the, the speeds at which the air is flowing at that, dis, that boundary between the air and the wing is greater, both top and bottom. That's called laminar flow. For example, one of the reasons you can go out here, uh, out around... Why did they build the, the um, telescope at Mount Wilson? Because you get a very interesting phenomenon. You get something that's called laminar flow, where on many nights, it's uh, you, uh, off the ocean current hitting the small mountains. Now, I don't know exactly what causes this, but it does happen. That is this flow of the, cooler, of the cool ocean air hitting the cooler air as you uh, get to the top of the mountain causes a layer of stable air with a very nice, even laminar flow, which is why when you use the telescope at Mount Wilson on some nights, you get very little flicker. You don't get disturbance from the atmosphere, or relatively less disturbance, much less disturbance. So it's places like this, which is where you want to put telescopes. So this kind of laminar flow, and what people like Busemann and Pronto looked at is they looked at these kinds of flow considerations. That's really how they began to design supersonic aircraft. Now, what was happening to um, uh, these propeller-driven planes was a, was a big problem. It had two characters to it. Okay? And I'll show you one in a second. But one was, or I'll just show you the consequence. One character of it we'll show you, was that as you hit 500, you know, 450, 500 miles an hour, the airflow off the top of the wing was already reaching sonic speeds. In other words, the, the, while the, the airspeed of the airplane was 500 miles an hour, the airflow over the top of the wing might have been some multiple of that, 1.1, 1.2. So the airflow over the top of the wing was already creating a compression front at the front of the wing. And if you look at it, we'll, we'll look at some of these things, I'll put them on, that you, you, the, the airflow would almost go straight up or begin to go straight up. And the flow over the top of the wing had a great deal of turbulence coming off the slowing down of the airflow. Now, secondly, the laminar flow was broken up. 
Because as this thing went through a shock front, the, the smooth airflow was ripped off. And you'll see this. I'll give you a graphic of it. And caused vortex flows, eddies and so forth coming off the wing. Now, besides which, the propeller couldn't handle it. So what you would get is a couple of things. As people would try to slow the aircraft down, besides the fact they were getting tremendous shocks in the flight, I mean, the plane was hard to control. For t one reason was when they would slow down, they would lose lift. The laminar flow was broken up, and the flow over the top of the wing was broken up, such that the differential was, uh, that was lost, and the lift was lost. So when they would slow down, they would go into a straight down dive. And this is not, I'm not giving you some, there are pictures of this, of these guys in test planes just going straight down. And I don't mean like that, I mean like that, okay? Because as they tried to handle it, they would just stall out completely. Now the other problem that they had was that the vortex flows coming off the shocks and the density of the air at the back of the plane made rudder control almost impossible. In other words, given the instruments that they had, they couldn't move the rudders. Now, I'll give you an idea. Like, to give you a sense of both how important some of this is and how little we know, and not, not to be ultra-modest, but we, we, there's things... One of the biggest dangers, uh, or actually, one of the significant dangers in commercial aircraft flight is we don't really 100% know what the wake of large commercial aircraft are. So like when a, when a 777 or a 747 or God knows it takes off and hits 200, 300 miles an hour on liftoff, and you try to fly behind this, there's a tremendous amount of turbulence that comes off these aircraft behind them off the wings, the wake. It's like the wake of a boat in a simple sense. But you're dealing with clear air and you're dealing with turbulences that you can't see. And our general calculations of these turbulences are, can be way off depending on the, the atmosphere that day, depending on the angle the aircraft takes off, depending on the angle that you're following it. And in fact, uh, the incident that happened in New York uh, in November of 2001, probably, despite the fact they blamed everything on the pilot uh, and so on and so forth, certainly was affected by the fact that you had a very large commercial aircraft following in the wake of a 747 or a 767, one of these big airplanes. And they had miscalculated the degree of turbulence coming off the front airplane. Okay, these are real phenomena. These are real world phenomena. Now, I'll give you a sense of, of, uh, of what they did. Why don't you give me the one that just shows you the, the graphic of the plan? No, 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 not that one. Yeah. Yeah. 259 people. <laughs> November of 2001. This one here. Yeah. Faster and the less dense. It's 660 at sea level. It's 750 at 40,000 feet, something like that. I don't, I don't know exactly. Um. Now look, here's the, the kind of thing that that, that, that you had to deal with, and you see you'll see what what uh, a little point makes as as the aircraft. Now here we have a typical fighter plane, jet, or or and I'll come back or um, prop. What happens is as these planes fly in, you get this shock front on the wings. I mean, we'll see this off the nose. It's a, it's a density, and the airflow itself changes its angle. Okay? Now, that causes, as I said, you get vortex flows, you get breakup of the laminar flow, 
that causes what they call a drag coefficient. But what it means is you're losing lift. You're getting flows over the wing at the front of the airplane that's causing there's densities. And in fact, one way to look at it is the shock front. You're transferring the energy to the shock front and you have less to lift the airplane. Now what they found was very, there were two things, two approaches. One was the kind of brute force approach, which is, aha, suppose we make the, th the wings thinner and stubbier, which was called the X1, okay, which, so that you get, you get the differential in the airflow much later. Therefore, you're not going to lose the lift, and maybe the laminar flow holds longer. So... That was one approach, but there was a pro So they did the, the first plane that went through the sound barrier was the X-1, which was a which was a was a short, stubby aircraft. But what was the problem with it? It was controlled flight, except you couldn't really take off with it because you couldn't get enough lift off the wings to begin with. So how did they fly this thing? They put it in a B-52. They put it in the undercarriage of a B-52. They flew it up to about 40,000 feet and a, probably something like 350, 400 miles an hour. And they dropped it. And then it had a rocket engine. And they ignited the rocket engine. And it flew in controlled flight through the sound barrier. And they could land it. Uh huh? Huh? Well, the idea is if you thin the wing, and it is true in general, you thin the wing. You don't, get, you don't get this shock front on the top of the wing that causes the turbulences there that breaks up the lift. So thin it, and you can go through it. That's the basic idea. Although it still didn't have very good rudder control, for example. Okay? Now, what the whole school of Busemann, Pronto, etc., they were focused on something totally different. They were focused on the boundary layer. How do you change the relationship to the shock front such that the aircraft design allows it, allows it to... Now, you did thin the wing and so on and so forth, but they did something else. They found that as they uh, angled the wings, including the tail, they lowered the drag coefficients. Now, there was a couple of reasons for this. For one thing, you're angling the shock front. You're changing the rate at which the shock front is hitting the aircraft and the wing, and you're creating conditions under which the vortex flows occur at the back of the airplane, the back of the wing. And you're maintaining some of the laminar flow. Now, all the details of this I couldn't tell you, but these are the consequences of the, of the design. Now, it also gives you something else. It gives you an airplane that can do controlled flight from takeoff to landing. Because even though there are problems in taking off with this kind of jet aircraft, in other words, you do lose a certain amount of lift at lower speeds. So you need higher speeds to take off. And they did other things. I mean, for example, now if you have, uh, you, you have variable wing aircraft, particularly for aircraft carriers. So you'll take off. You have a wing that takes off flat out, and then it folds back. And it folds back into a different wing design. Okay? So... By changing the angle at which the shock front hits the airplane, you, cha you change the characteristics of the flow over the wing. You change the, w in effect, you're changing your relationship to a changed meter. Because the air density is greater, the flow of the wing is different, over the wing is different, you're catching the vortex flows over the edge of the wing. You're getting lift at the back, and you're changing the densities at the rudder. So you change, and you're maintaining to a certain extent the laminar flow. It doesn't get broken up by the vortexes as much. So you've changed the design of the aircraft because you're also flying through a different medium. You're now flying through a medium that has a series of boundaries, both at the wing and the way the air interacts with the wing, and the front of the wing and the front of the aircraft. So you're recognizing that the shock fronts, the discontinuities, one way to look at this, 
which is a little bit different than I think we think about it. Think of this as two surfaces. Not really surfaces in the way we think of surfaces as a geometric image. But we've now changed, you might say, the dynamic characteristics of the relationship between the aircraft and the, and the medium, the airflow. And you've gone through a singularity, which is one before you have any shock front, any de air uh, densities in front of the airplane, to one in which you're flying through the singularities through the increasing densities and a series of densities, as you'll see in a minute. Now, conceptually, that's what I want people to look at. There's a lot of stuff to look at in terms of what happens. I don't necessarily recommend everybody get into it. There might be some things that are worth looking at. Because the idea of the medium that Prontel, Busemann, Riemann, etc. had is totally different. This idea of the laminar flow is not just an interesting phenomena. It's because they treat the relationship between the, the wing and the air as a discontinuity. And I'll, I'll give you another interesting example of this. As something that, that is a changed relationship because you've got two different kind of phenomena that require, that create a different physical flow. And here what we have is something where we're going to literally change our conception of the medium and change the design of the aircraft. Now, a good, why don't we go through that sequence from, uh, oh, no, I know, Just show me, give me the cylinder first. The cylinder. Here it is. I just want to give you an example. It does, oh, God, it doesn't come out there. You can, can you see a little bit? This is a cylinder in a water flow. Okay, so the water is flowing from left to right across the cylinder. Okay. Now, as the rate of flow, now look, what you see here is this. This is this area, this boundary. What's happening is you have a fairly smooth flow of the water around the cylinder, whatever material it is. Because it, this is a similar to a laminar flow. The water is just nicely flowing over it in a nice rapid stream. It's completely smooth, and there's no problem. Okay. Now, as the flow accelerates on the rear end, and you'll see how this works, you begin to get a turbulence, which is about to pull the laminar flow off, break it up, and you can barely see it, but you come, it expands out here. And so this thin layer back here becomes even thinner, and the vortex is beginning to flow off and breaking up the laminar flow. If we had the pictures better, You'll see this comes out as two actual vortexes that have pulled the laminar flow away from the cylinder. What's the laminar flow? It's the it's the it's the point. It's the the increase. The, it's the, the the boundary layer at which the air meets the wing. And so this, because it's different material, different kinds of processes, the flow changes. It's not a normal air flow. It's a flow of things that are, that are stuck to the molecules, et cetera, at the top of the wing. And they're now flowing differently. It's a discontinuity. It's a boundary. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it thins out. And until it actually, the turbulence, if you see this, you'll see the layer thins and breaks off. It's too bad you can't. All right? You lose the relatively smoother flow. Now, actually, there's a physics to this laminar flow, which, you know, I don't know the details of it. I know it's a, it, it exists. It happens. And the whole idea, the, the way Prontel and Busemann looked at it, was there had to be something different that the point at which the airflow meets the wing, you've got a fixed object and, you, and you've got a flow of air across it, at the boundary layer there's going to be a different kind of activity because there's something there that doesn't exist just in the air. Okay? Now, how, you know, beyond that you have to look up what goes on. But these, when I talk about the turbulence across the wing, this is, this is a liquid flow. Okay? But the same thing happens. 
it breaks up. And once you break this up, you've broken up the relatively smooth flight, you cause turbulence, and you lose lift when it comes to an airplane. Now, let me give you a sense. We should look at those Schlieren pictures. These are worth, you know, yeah, 22 through 26. Yeah, yeah. These are these. Now, this is a bullet. Shot through, I guess, some kind of liquid. And what you see is the same phenomenon. You get a conic, remember, bullets fly at the speed of sound or more. So you, you, the density in the front, and the, the bullet is literally flying over the shock fronts. And this creates a wave, a turbulence that's of a, you know, a, a, a greater sort than you would get in a normal flight. But what you have here, these are the shock fronts. And what you're getting is the phenomena of the, the, the wave in front of the bullet, so to speak, is moving slower than the bullet. So the bullet is flying over these, inc these densities, which are then piling up in the back. Okay, now go, go ahead. Okay, this is, um, I think it's a similar thing. This is also it's just a broader picture. So you see this thing, you see the, the, the expanse of the conic shock, and then it's flowing back over some of these waves behind it. Okay? Now here's an aircraft, so you get an idea of this. Watch the turf, watch this. As this thing goes up, this is all, look how the density of the air now comes back across the wing. It comes off the tail. You get a sense of the complexity of all this. Huh? Now actually you also get, you can see some of the, you'll see this better in another one. You can see some of the breakup of the shock front here. And in the back. Yeah. The vortex of the cone seems to, regardless of the uh, angle of the airplane, mm -hmm. is that like a, a perpendicular to the axis of the uh, curve? Yeah, I don't know the exact dynamics of this, to tell you the truth. Okay? I know what you can see. You can see all this coming off, right? As it changes the angle, the flow comes off, and you get a, you get a, a, a break up of the airflow in the back here. Now, in a sense, you can see also how the angling of the, of the tail is important here. Because previously, this would come right back on and lock the tail up. Okay? Now, I'll show you something neat, interesting. Go ahead. Go to the next one. Okay, this is a rocket. Right? And again, at least you get a sense, because remember, this doesn't even have a wing. What you see is the conic shock and it, the flying over of the previous shock run. So you get a sense of how, you know, how much different this is in normal flight, where everything is in front of you. Okay? You're not escaping it. You're not escaping it. You're changing the design to give it stability through the shock front. So the way the wing is organized is to catch the lift off the back of the wing as you're going through this conic front. So it's, you're not escaping it. In a certain sense, you're using it. Okay? There's actually a way to get lift off the vortex flow. If you can get the vortex flow to come down off the wing which some of the design of the wing is to do, you get lift from the vortex, which you normally don't get. Go ahead. Okay, that, now look, here's where you get, begin to see things. This is a close-up of the front. It, I don't know if this is a shuttle or a rocket. Anyway, this is, this is an infrared. You see what's happening here. As this shock, second shock front hits on the top of the plane, you're getting this, this is a, a heating up of the surface of the, of the um, of the vehicle, right? And you can, this is the kind of turbulence as these shock fronts hit one another. And you can sort of see it better here, but you can, all right? Go ahead. Now, this might be, this is a, oh God, it's going to come off. Anybody? Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Anyway, it's going this way. It's a better shot, actually. You can see that you can see the shot front comes back, but it hits a sh second shot front because now we're going at, we're at supersonic speed, right? And this is going to create tremendous turbulence down here. Now, the way in which you want to shape the aircraft is to deflect some of this turbulence, if possible, to shape things so that you're using the turbulence to give you uh, to aid your flight. But these are the kinds of things you're flying for. So it's totally different flight than subsonic flight. It's a completely different medium, yeah. Is this where NASA was going to on Reentry? Like no, this is liftoff. Oh, okay. Yeah. But Reentry is a, a big... Uh, well, to, uh, yeah, but I'll tell you, there you're dealing... Here's something very interesting about the space shuttle. The space shuttle on re-entry in free flight is flying about 15 to 17,000 miles an hour. There is no wind tunnel that can tell you what's going to happen. <laughs> there are no wind tunnels that can replicate that at presently. So in a sense, the only experiment that gives you some idea what happens with something like the space shuttle on re-entry is the space shuttle. That's part of... Uh, you might say the risk involved in the space shuttle. Okay. So in, now again, when I'm, when I'm trying, one way to look at this is you've got to change surface function. You're going through a, a density of singularities, and they can pile up before you reach sonic, su supersonic flight. You get certain kinds of maxima, minima discontinuities even before that. The breakup of the laminar flow starts earlier. The shape of the wind creates certain things. And then you're going, you've reached this boundary condition where you've got to change your conception of the medium because it's now not, it's not flight through air where the, the uh, sonic wave is in front of you. You're now going through the sonic waves themselves. And the characteristics of flight are different. So in a sense, from a Riemannian standpoint, you have to find out what kind of design sh is shaped such that it's capable of flight in two different regimes. So it has a certain kind of continuity through the change. All right, is there a no? But I, I don't. Okay. All right, so. That at least gives you some idea what some of this stuff um, looks like. Now, I want to give you... So, the, the, the point that I want to make now is, look, this is... When we talk about Gauss, when we talk about Riemann, they have a unique approach to these things. Lord Rayleigh said the shock front doesn't exist. Riemann is wrong. This is the idea of anti-Euclidean geometry. Part of the reason they thought it couldn't happen is because they had linear extensions of fixed ideas of how airflow works, of what you might call the geometry of these things. When in fact, these things, these geometries, these airflows, these regimes of activity have a continuity through the shock front, through the change. And a shock front is just a singularity, a boundary condition. There are all kinds of things that occur before you get there. In part, what happens is the density of singularities reaches a boundary condition. Now the question is, what kind of activity allows you to shape the medium and shape the vehicle such that you can continue, in this case, to fly? Now, if we go back to the first thing, The issue here is not how we're going to fly in the hedge fund driven financial system. <laughs> okay. the, the issue is we've got instability. In effect, this thing is about to crash. The question is how do we reshape the medium and redesign the aircraft? Now, that takes more than just saying, you, know, you really have to think, what do we need in terms of infrastructure? What do we need in terms of, of, of um, labor? What do we need ter in terms of science driver projects? 
How do we increase the living standard? Now, I don't want to go a whole lot. Okay. Um, the, um, I'll go through a couple points. Um, well, just to give you an idea, partly this is, a, you know, just to give you an idea of how much this is part of the physical processes of the universe. Okay. I have, let's look at that one in the corona. This is a picture of the sun. This is some of the activity this is during an eclipse. And you have this enormous activity in what's called the corona. The surrounding, there's actually two coronas. There's the lower and the upper corona. Now, this is fabulous at some level. I mean, you've got to realize this is a huge electromagnetic phenomenon. These are what, you call, what we call solar flares are really huge arcs of electromagnetic activity where the whole thing is completely ionized. Uh, you have magnetic fields that are thousands of times the size of the Earth and so on. But let me give you an idea of this laminar question in a different way. Uh, ultraviolet pictures of the sun allow us to study for the first time the thin and elusive transition region where temperatures in the solar atmosphere jump abruptly from 50,000 degrees Kelvin in the upper chromosphere to 2 million degrees in the corona. Now, like, the surface of the sun is 6 to 10,000 degrees. The close, some elements of the corona are about 20,000. This is the surrounding element of electromagnetic activity. It's not the center of the sun. Now, there's a transition layer where the temperatures jump from 50,000 degrees to 2 million degrees. Okay? The transition region is more than a curiosity. The physical processes that happen there are keys to the conditions in the corona, which in turn dictate the particle and magnetic field environment of the Earth. The important jump in temperature between the chromosphere and corona happens in a layer so thin that it is almost a discontinuity. Nothing like it occurs in the temperature structure of the atmosphere of the ocean, atmosphere of the atmosphere of the oceans of the Earth, or anywhere else in the solar system. No, it's a jump. It's a, it's a, no, it's above the surface. You have the corona. The corona expands out. You have to look at more, and there's a tr transition layer in the corona, where you jump from 50,000 to 2 million degrees, and that's the hottest part of the sun, not the inside. Okay. Now there's all kinds of theories as to why this happens, but I don't think there's anything settled on the question. Because there's a usefulness in knowing there's a lot of things we don't know. Not to be humble and modest about science, but there's a problem when people say, no, it's all settled. We know. It's all Newtonian, or it's Newtonian plus something else. Hello? It could be. These are things to look at. Yeah. Yeah, these are things that are worth looking at. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, what I read to you is what I, is what I know of it. But I'm, part, I'm trying to get across this idea of these boundary conditions, these transitions, these physical transitions. This is part of the universe. This is not some oddball economic throw-in. Okay? This is the way the physical universe operates. I'll give you another. Some of this is just fun. Uh, let's look at this, uh, the, the magnetosphere and the heliopause. Let's look at the heliopause first.
Okay. Well, at least this is better. Anyway, um, this is, in a sense, this is an image of the extent of the solar system. This is the sun. These are the planets. Now, what you get is, you get the solar wind that flows out from the sun. And it meets the incoming intergalactic cosmic activity, which is a thin but fascinating layer of cosmic radiation. Now, as the solar wind hits this uh, intergalactic cosmic radiation, it forms a termination shock. In other words, this is sort of the beginning of the end of the solar system. It's probably, you know, you can see this is Pluto. It's, it's way beyond Pluto. Okay, it's about, I know, so I, I saw a figure 16 astronomical units. Let me see if I can find it. Well, we're beyond theory because remember we have things that have been out there. Pioneer, Voyager is getting close to it. So we're measuring things that are out there at this point. Okay? I, it doesn't have it. I can't find it. I'm not going to waste the time. This is a book that uh, Sky got from his father, I guess, from JPL, right, Sky? Yeah, some things may be up there, but I tell you, this stuff. I just read stuff about this. Anyway, I, I don't know how far out it is. It's way out. It's about twice. You can see from this. It's about at least twice the distance to Pluto. Okay. So now, but that's not the end of it because where the solar wind hits the cosmic radiation, you get a layer of activity. And this is all a shock front where these two things are hitting. And there's an interplay so that this pulses back and forth. So the heliopause, or that is the end of the solar system, is not a simple definite boundary. It's a boundary which is created by the, inter the, 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 the nature of this shock front and pulses. In fact, what they found is it's very hard to measure where the heliopause is because you have the termination shock of the solar wind itself, but then that interacts with the cosmic element to create another flow. And really to understand these things, you've got to look at this from a completely Riemannian standpoint. All of this stuff. Yeah. Is the solar wind, is it flow in all directions? Yeah, yeah. This is, you should take this as a three-dimensional. You, you, I'll show you something else. Well, let me get, when we get to this, I'll show you. Why don't we do the magnetosphere, just so people get... solar wind, this is the Earth. Now, these are something like the magnetic field lines 
And actually, the reason this looks the way it does is the magnetic field lines are being affected by the solar wind, which itself is ionized. So it has certain magnetic effects. This is called the Bose shock. So there's a shock around this. And because of what this does to the Earth's magnetic field, you get on the other side of where the sun is hidden a plasma sheet. Now this is like this is like the turbulent flow off of a shock drum. Now all this affects the electromagnetic condition of the Earth. Now you can see one sentence. This is going to affect all. This affects weather. Much of this we don't really know. I don't. Really, we don't. The, the point is there are things we know and there are things we don't know. So when somebody says, we know why there's this condition, they don't know. They're taking a simple statistical uh, expansion of previous data without taking into account the kinds of things that might be quite different. Yeah. Well, we can measure it up to a point, but we have to take... Look, the way this stuff works, it's a much longer kind of story. The way this stuff works is... This is exactly the way knowledge works. You do have an idea. You take some idea of what's going on. And then a new principle creates some kind of a discontinuity. Maybe it is a principle. Maybe it's just a discontinuity in what you already have. Maybe it's just a new arrangement of what you've got that creates a phenomena. But you get to certain ones that are inexplicable without some further principle. So, for example... You know, you have something very simple. We're going around on the planet Earth. The planet Earth is going around the sun. So you assume, for example, that you've got circular orbits. Fine. But then you realize that the circular orbits become very complex to maintain what you know is going on. So you say, well, maybe there's another principle operating here that's creating elliptical orbits. Once we know that, you may say, if something goes wrong, we know there's something else that might be operating. Yeah, Sky? Yeah, there's a bunch of different uh, factors in there that I was at a talk by a guy who runs the uh, uh, infrared telescope, the Yellow Infrared Crash Network. And he talked about it at one point. He started, he started going through this model for how uh, the telescope is going to kill this component. And since it was new, it was exactly, exactly what Nick was saying about how you had the, uh, how you had the uh, refraction information. The thing he said is that you see here the, uh, the effect of the sun. Because they don't want, what, what's really threatened is you'd have to look at the history of science in a different way. You'd have to resurrect a different view of Riemann, of Gauss. Not, they use Riemann, but they use the mathematical formula. They don't use the idea. Now, to give you an interesting thing, I, I didn't get a picture of this. Um, but in terms of what's going on, the, the interaction of, maybe I'll pet, the interaction of the magnetic field of the planet, Earth, and the, the, bo the shock from the solar wind creates a toroidal field around the planet Earth. Donut-shaped radiation belts that encircle the Earth. And the way this is formed is actually what happens. Now, this goes to what we were discussing last night. And this is where you have to look for how these transitions occur. When the, when the solar wind, the ionized plasma, hits the magnetic field of the Earth, the plasmas move in a helical shape. And that helical motion creates a semi-toroid -tor around the planet Earth. Well, I can pass it around. Maybe I should just do that. You can look at it. It's around the planet here.
It's ion. It's it's ion. It's plasma. It's, it's radiation. It's X-rays. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to go a whole lot further. Now, huh? Huh? Well, there's been theories about not so much sailing a ship, but actually they've had this idea of putting this gigantic, uh, if you could put out, and they've done some things with this actually, okay, if you could put out a spacecraft that had one of these fit men, when it would get out there, it would have like a thin, Aluminum type foil sail. So you have this little spacecraft, this gigantic sail that you could actually navigate with the solar moon. Mm -hmm. There's been a couple ideas, and maybe even a couple. Of, I think it, one thing they put up there is a, it, it didn't it didn't open up properly. They actually have the idea of doing it. Yeah. It's you know it's highly diffuse, but it's real. Okay. Now. Um, just to kind of. Let, let me just look real quick at the, uh, the, uh, the pedagogy. Well, before, before we get to that, okay, go, go back. We'll just give you one. I'll give you a run through. Let's take these ones that we didn't do. Not that one. Fourteen, fifteen. Maybe it won't show up. Well. These are intergalactic phenomena. This is a shot front around an expanding star. Yeah, this is a, uh, an, an intergalactic disk coming off of one of these things, and you can see some of the effects. This is just giving you an idea. It's all over the place. It's not unlike the Crab Nebula that we looked at years ago, all right? These are all. Hubble Space Telescope pictures. And you should get that. Yeah, yeah. All right. Now let's go to the Riemann pedagogy thing. All I want to do is real quick show it, go through something. This, here's an idea to look at. This, and this we get, and I think, oh wait, what happens to that? Okay. Here you have a simple algebraic function, fourth power algebraic function. What you see is these, the, this is the, the root, the zero, the solution. So you see, if you line these up, the function simply rotates around these things. Now, what the algebraic function is a finite number of discontinuities, but unbounded. You can keep going up. You can keep adding them. That's your first simple algebraic. Now, go to the next one. Okay, now we have a complex sign. Okay, it's, it's got, this is a better one. It's got a period. It repeats itself, but it loops around two singularities. Okay? So you have a simple period, a different kind of function. It's closed. Okay? But it keeps going. And you can see it somewhat in, in these branches. So in a sense, you have two singularities, but an, an infinite number of branch points. And it repeats like itself. Huh? In the illustrations you give of the magnetic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Some of the stuff you were doing. Go to the next one. Now we get to an elliptical function. Doubly periodic. Okay. Again, it's, it's like what you're saying, but an infinite number of branches. Okay, so what happens? Your your surface is defined by the number of singularities, because the way in which you're gonna you're gonna join these surfaces up is by a two branch cuts, two <laughs> cuts to join two pairs of singularities. Now, what Riemann demonstrated was that if you take the algebraic, the complex sign, the elliptical, each of these represent, in some ways, unique kinds of functions. They represent a series of transcendentals. Now, in a way, what are we looking at when we look at 
an economy, or we look at these kinds of physical phenomena. We're looking for the different qualities, different kinds of boundary conditions, different singularities, and the different way in which we have to you know, work with the surfaces. What are the principles? This is now just an image. What principles would create this? What kinds of different points at which a new principle has to be discovered? What kind of anomalies are we working with? Now, in a sense, that's what we mean when we can say we've come to endgame. We've got to operate by something completely different. We've got to add or act directly from the standpoint of certain physical economic characteristics. But also, I think it should give you an idea of the way in which this physical geometry, this physical sense of the way the world develops, of what are the governing principles of it. This is what Lynn means by the Dirichlet principle, that the nature of this geometry is determined by the boundary conditions, the limits of it, and the way at which it generates singularities, the way in which you can operate within that geometry. Now, <clears throat> we can end that. Just to end, because I'm ending on time here. Um, I want to give you something that addresses how much this goes to the way in which we have to change the way people think about these things. This is from Vernadsky. Now, now we have a right to admit, for the space we live in, the manifestation of geometrical properties answering all three forms of geometry, Euclidean, Lobachevsky, and Riemannian. This inference is logically completely valid, but a further study is needed for understanding whether it is true. Regretfully, a host of empirical observations related to this area and scientifically established is not assimilated by the biologists and did not enter their scientific world outlook. Nevertheless, as it is shown by Curie, such special state of space cannot arise in a usual space without special circumstances. Using his terms, a disymmetric phenomenon must always be caused by a likewise disymmetric cause. This corresponds to basic empirical generality that the living takes its origin in the living and that any organism is born from another organism. But he's saying, number one, life produces life because there's characteristics of the physical space state of life that can only be, you can't move from one to the other without being in that physical space state. That has to be there in order to act on it. Now, he later says, I'm not going to, The condition of space corresponding to the body of a living organism is disymmetric, be that volume great or small. This fact manifests itself in rightness and leftness, in the inequality of clockwise and anticlockwise. Ah. Essentially, this per preservation of life's duration within all geological time by division, budding, or birth is the main manifestation of the special space-time of the living natural bodies of the special geometry of space-time. So he, he, basically, what I get, he's grappling with this idea. He, he does have a conception of a dynamic relationship between life, the non-living, and the living, and the, and the, and the, and the creative. And that these three work together, but each of them has a different geometrical principle. Yet, they act on one another. Therefore, it's not Euclidean. There's no fixed axiom. Geometry, the geometry of life, the geometry of knowledge, is a geometry of qualitative change in the principles that order our activity and order the activity of the universe. It's that which you have to discover. And that's why we, we never come to an end. That's why you always have to, have to ask yourself, what don't we know? And in a sense, that, I, and that's the reason I, I threw a few of those things up. Now, in principle, we're acting right now politically 
in this shock front zone in a transition from a failed state. And the question is, can we create, and this is the fourth domain, can we organize and communicate the kinds of ideas and actions related to it which create an entirely new shape of human activity. All right? So I'm going to end there. Well, I mean, I would look, want to look at something more active. In other words, you want to look at a, an actual moving system. There, there's always some... Look, the universe is always change. One of the biggest problems you have is people want to think of something as a fixed system. And they say, well, within this fixed system, what do you do? Or uh, my favorite example of it is perfection. Everybody wants perfection. And this is where I think you get this idea of, of, a, me, of a mechanical system. Where do you get, give me a set of rules that tells me that everything is going to work? And that's a dead universe. Human beings couldn't live in that kind of universe. Perfection is no change. It's a simple set of rules where everything happens over and over again the same way. It's funny because, yeah, right? Yeah. The, it, uh, it, in truth, a perfect universe is a universe in which you can discover more about the universe. The, the paradox is if you can discover more about the universe, then you can act differently in the universe, so it's a different universe. Yeah, yeah, this is a, it, it's a huge... Uh, epistemological problem. I, you know, this is a problem that I think ultimately messed up Contour because Contour, if, if you look at what Riemann did, he, generate, he demonstrates that you can generate a sequence of what he calls transcendentals. You get it to a point where the previous, the next uh, set of functions is not measurable by the previous set. It's not, there's something different. So you're going through a transition. You're going through a boundary condition. Then you have all of these transitions. Okay? And now you can talk about those as transfinites, depending on how you define, uh, you know, what you want to consider. De depending on how you show a different metric comes up. So the counting numbers and the real numbers are different. But what underlies this is you really reach a certain, uh, you can say, density of change that gives you a larger change, a change that's now uh, completely unmeasurable by anything that went before it. A little bit like the square root, but really beyond that. Okay? Like, for example, the square root does not really, it's incommensurable, but it doesn't give you a higher power, a higher, uh, 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 an uncountable um, number of things, so to speak. So you move to the, finally you get something that's completely uncountable by the previous measurements. Now, the problem with Contour is he always wanted to go back to a linear relationship amongst these things. And his big question was, what's the linear continuum? How do you count that? What is it? And he got very stuck on this because a lot of people insisted that if his system was going to work, you had to be able to count a linear continuum, an unchanging continuum. But the whole point of the generation of, the, of, of Contour's theory was that it was a changing continuum. The whole point of Riemann's work is there's a, there's a differentiation amongst transcendentals. And then there's an ordering of transcendentals. So, in effect, there is no linear continuum. 
there's a continuum of a certain kind of change in the universe. It is lawful, but it's a continuum of change. It's a continuum of progressive development. And it can't be reduced to some simple formula or some simple mechanism. Ultimately, I think that's what Lynn means by a dynamic system. It's a system that's determined by the, the, whole to, the totality of where it's going. Not where it's been. And it's the principle that governs the whole system. That affects everything going on in the system. And that's what you're really looking for. That's Dirichlet's principle. It's not the shape, the fixed shape. It's the determining conditions of the way this thing is going to change. So where are the boundaries? Where are the maxima and minima? Where are the sing points of singularity? That tells you what the nature of the system is. And, so, and it tells you where you're going to have to change. So the point of supersonic flight is it's just a nice example, not the most complicated or most important. But because there were so many controversies about it, about how if you look at this as a dynamic system and you know where, you, wh wh where you're going, what changes are required, you can organize the medium and the vehicle to change its relationships such that you can exist in both circumstances. Anything else? air through the jet engine too much, too quick, the heat melts the system. So you do have to, now then you, you have to figure out, can you go from a transition, can you sequence, I mean one thing I didn't go into here, but anyway that's what goes on there. Okay. So it, it, to my knowledge there's no more transitions in the atmosphere. I could be wrong. Yeah. But the problems you have now are the actual working into, maybe we'll look at it some other time, that's very real is um, the question of inertial confinement fusion. Right, we'll do that because there's two approaches to inertial confinement, which is, and it's, it's probably one of the more interesting ways to go, and it is one of the great problems that's going to have to be solved. And you can see how when you stay below a certain threshold of activity, you can't solve it. You need a, a, a science driver approach, which includes financing, experimentation. Anyway, this goes to this question of entropy. Because one approach is if you take a pellet of fuel and you surround it with a little metal sheet. The problem you hear with laser and you try to fuse it is you've got this, this the heat distribution blows the pellet apart. Most of the design work, and this is where Lynn was involved with these guys. This is all very real. And these guys operated by a computer program that Lynn mentioned recently called LabNex. And the idea was they were trying to program the, uh, uh, the laser charging such that you would create what they call weak shots, one after the other, in the pellet by hitting it sequentially. And by hitting the shots weak enough, you would keep what they call the entropy close to one. In other words, you wouldn't lose, the heat wouldn't blow it apart, to put it in simple terms. And maybe the shots would build up and explode it. Now, what Lynn proposed was something totally different. Lynn proposed maybe a buildup of a couple of weak shots and then a strong shock that created a, 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 
uh, uh, a, a change in the way the pellet itself operates. So that the strong shot would catch up rapidly with the weak shot and shape themselves such that they would implode and you wouldn't have an entity on This is a real debate between the New England Lions and Livermore people in the late 70s and early 80s. And one of the reasons we don't have fusion, or at least even this directionality, is they've been stuck in this simple computer model where they're trying to infinitely approximate by a series of infinitely weaker shots a zero, a, you know, a, a, a non-entropic implosion. Where Lynn's point is, you gotta move to a whole different uh, uh, approach to what happens. You gotta move to a shock front that changes the behavior of the target itself, the enemy itself. So, that's the kind of thing I think, a little, you know, those are the kinds of things that, these are real life problems. One that I think is critical, you know, in the long run to how we're going to organize the physical economy. We do have to move in certain directions in terms of uh, power sources that are completely different than what we have now. Not just from the standpoint of using up oil, but from the standpoint of this whole issue of other things that oil should be used for. Plus the cost of transportation. I mean, you, talk, you, you, you could be talking about fusion devices that are, you know, relatively easy to transport, relatively easy to create at almost any location. And th then you're dealing in a plasma realm wh where you're, you're dealing with material problems and so on that you can resolve in totally different ways. For example, it is the case if you have a fusion base energy, base system, you have a, a, it gives you a whole different ability to create resources. Not so much to create resources, but to use things as resources that otherwise would be next to, you know, next to impossible. I mean, the extreme case of it is, you know, if you take a cubic yard of any part of the surface of the Earth, it's got virtually everything in it, including precious metals, rare metals, and there are trace elements, but so small that it's mining it would be insane. But if you had a, if you had the density of a fusion capability, you might be able to mine, at least in some ways, relatively important resources out of places we would, we would, we would consider today as nothing. Besides the ability to ionize um, uh, trash, for instance, and separate things out. So the, the idea, you, your whole resource base at least potentially is totally different in, a, in an economy that has the densities of a fusion-based economy. Problem is you'll never get there unless you go to a fission-based economy. Properly understood, there's no reason for poverty in the world, at least as a direction. Yeah, Ricky? It's the ability to be creative. In other words, look, individual human beings are, are mortal, but there's a creative principle in the universe, and the universe is characterized by the dire direction of that creative principle. Therefore, that creative principle has a personality. I say this somewhat offhand because, you know, people get so worked up about the word God and all this kind of stuff, you know. Oh. But there's a, there's a personality to the universe which is outside the universe. So it's that, the fact that you have the ability to communicate creative ideas and change our relationship to the universe tells you that the, the creative principle of the universe itself has a personality, which is not any one of us. Though we, in, in Plato's sense, partake of that capability. We're part of that capability. And that's the 
the identity of the universe. I don't know. The Old Testament. There's a law in the Old Testament that every seven years you wipe out debts. And, every, and really, every, every seven years you do certain things, and every 50 years you wipe out all debt. But I don't, I don't know the reference. I'm just pumping for, you know, old-style stuff. Huh? I don't know enough. I really don't know enough about Louis XI. Well, look, one thing you should realize, there's all kinds of strictures against excessive usury. That's not a joke. Uh, even, even the Old Testament, though, again, typically the problem is it's you know, only with respect to other Israelites. But you're not supposed to charge excessive interest rates. Islam has this. I mean, Christianity has it, at least implicitly. I mean, any sane person is going to tell you, the idea of uh, uh, excessive interest rates, usury, usury was a great crime and a great sin. People have known this for years. We, we live in a somewhat insane period where you're, you're really good if you can rip somebody off. <laughs> Think about how many people admire these guys who are going to jail. And they'll tell you, well, come on, they're no different than anybody else, and they're right. And, and they say, well, that's, why should we put them in jail? They're just making money like anybody else is making money. So usury, frankly, I doubt that there's an ethical code or a religious code that doesn't at some point or other make the point, even if it doesn't have a mechanism, that usurious interest is uh, you know, a crime against, the, uh, against another human being. It's insane. Right. Look, this is why he's going after the baby boomers. I mean, leave aside all the funny stuff. Um, you know, parents, crazy, debt, sex. I mean, it's a crazy culture. You know, it's a nut place. I mean, you know, it went nutty. You know, like I was telling people somewhere, I know it was Oakland. There, there's no anti-war movement. There was no anti-war movement. There was a counterculture movement. And as I said before, it's drugs and sex and escapism. But what's the real point? The real character of baby boomerhood is precisely I don't want to go into, the, into a, a, any <coughs> creative challenge to what I've been doing for most of my life. This is it. I refuse to go anywhere. I refuse to change anything. I have no passion about the future. I find that oppressive. If you ask me to be passionate about the future, you're oppressing me. That's authoritarianism. And so, in, in fact, precisely this idea of, that's why he's raised the question of immortality. That you do something for the future. You do something for when you're not going to be here. To put it in its simplest terms. And the, 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 the baby boomer generation consciously said, I will not do anything for any time that I'm not here or doesn't rebound immediately to my glory and benefit. So that's why, this, uh, that's why I think you find the fundies so interested in heaven and hell. You know, they, they think they're going to buy their way into heaven. But it, it, it is the case. We're, we're introducing an entirely, certainly a principle that culturally has been lost. I don't know that it never existed. Maybe it existed in other forms. You can say that the Christian movement against the Roman Empire had a quality of this. But it's certainly something that's been completely lost in the culture. 
You're an idiot if you think about the future and not, your, not you know, s- some immediate form of pleasure for yourself or gain for yourself. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Well, it's, it's 12 o'clock. We should probably... All right, we'll reconvene about one.